Thank you very much. It's a real delight to be invited to join in with this. Uh, it was lots of fun on uh, it was Tuesday night, wasn't it? Um, it was lots of fun on Tuesday night. Um, I certainly kind of um, learned and enjoyed it and, and made new connections in conversations with people. And uh, it's just an excuse as well to see lots of lovely old, old friends and faces at St. G's, uh, which is just a real privilege for me. So, um, so thank you for having me. As you had said, I what we did on Tuesday and since worked quite well is, is first of all, to get people um, just making those connections. I'd love to know a bit more about the Bible passages that really stimulate people and inspire people and challenge people when they're thinking about climate change. So, so let's just, we'll, we'll be making connections and thinking about which bits of the Bible uh, are, are relevant to us. Uh, and so we'll pop into breakout groups in a minute and then share some of those and that will that will be helpful that will give us something to work with and then secondly um what are the questions that people face either because you think okay here's a here's a theology question about this here's something i don't understand or here's something i, I want to you know know more about or or the questions you think that others have about about why this is happening or or, or uh, the role of the church and the theology of climate change so, so something on the Bible just to get us started and then and then raising some questions and then um, before the end of the session we'll just work through as many of those questions as we can. So should we just take a moment to pray and then we'll um, and then we'll, we'll start with our Bible challenge. Father we bless you so much for your presence with us. We bless you that you are present, that in you we live and move and have our being. And we ask that you make that presence real to us now in honest discussion, in wise sharing and in open questioning. So that we can shine as your lights in the world at a time of climate crisis. We ask your blessing on this time together in Jesus name. Amen. Okay, so uh, so your first little breakout challenge, and the question is, what Bible passages speak to you about climate care? Okay, welcome, welcome back, folks. Um, I wonder if people might be willing to use the chat function uh, if you if you're able to, and just type in some of the the bits of the scripture that really grabbed hold of you when you're thinking about care for creation. And, uh, and then we could kind of just see what, what different groups were coming up with. We certainly had a quite the, quite the biblical tour. And um, so there's, there's lots of potential things out there. So if we could, if people could just type something in the chat. Yeah, there's some really uh, interesting stuff coming up here. Um, so one of the things that I like, I was really, I, I like the, that you mentioned, Ros, was, was the trees roaring. That, that reminds me of the, one of the great biblical themes is the capacity of creation. Creation is able to, to do certain things. It has a, this capacity to, and as people have mentioned, it has a capacity to teach us. It has a capacity for praise. It has a capacity for, for awe, to evoke awe and wonder. So creation isn't this entirely kind of passive thing. It's not just a receptacle or like a, a dead object. One of the great uh, critiques of after, after, the, um, after the kind of reformation period of, of, the, of the scientific worldview was one, one of the traps that we tended to feel, fall into was to think of, of nature as, as, as matter. It's just kind of just lifeless matter. And um, some atheist uh, scientists fall into this trap from time to time, but also some Christians, um, we collude with it. Um, and we're like, yeah, 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 there's dead matter and then there's life. But actually, um, uh, and, and we think that God's more interested in the life than in kind of the matter. But actually creation has this incredible capacity for praise, this, this capacity to, to make a joyful noise, um, this capacity to, to draw us to God, to point us to God. And um, if we're going to talk about, um, uh, nobody's mentioned the sacraments, uh, but like if we were to, um, 
if we were to talk about the bread and the wine and, and the waters of baptism, we talk about the capacity that creation has to kind of to carry the presence of God, to, to carry the blessing of God. So creation has this incredible capacity. There's, there's a lot, a lot of references to justice. Stuart, why have you, can I ask you, tell us about why, why, why passages about poverty and oppression, of which there are so many, why would you connect that with uh, the climate crisis? Well, because, because it's the people who are uh, poor and oppressed are already being badly affected by climate change. And we were thinking that, that there is an injustice in the fact that people are benefiting uh, financially from uh, the climate crisis and other people are having their livelihoods destroyed. And so we think God cares about that. And so we should care about that. Yeah. Um... That's interesting. I've, I, that's made me think about a connection I've never made before. If you read the, um, if you read the Old Testament from time to time, time you come across boundary markers. Okay? People have, have come across boundary markers, and it reflects the the kind of the the, the ancient uh, Near Eastern farming settlement that you, you know your family would have somewhere to land, uh, to, somewhere to, to live and to farm, and my family would have somewhere to live and to farm, and each of these. Each of these, we'd all have parceled out areas of land, a little bit like boxes on a Zoom call. And each of us would live within our, 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 our lotted area. You know, the boundary markers have fallen for me in the pleasant, you know, in pleasant places. And one of the one of the sins in the Old Testament is to move a boundary marker. Because your your land becomes bigger and my land becomes smaller. I'd not thought about it before, but just as you were talking, Stuart, that's that's this idea that there's a, there's a there are part part of the task of of living together in a physical space is the task of of managing resources which to some extent are finite. Now I don't actually believe that the Bible teaches that all resources are finite, you know, and 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 the whole point about renewable energy renewable energy is that you know some resources are not effectively finite in the way that others might be but but certainly when it talks about the land you know it's thinking about well there's, there's, a, there's a amount of space but I was just thinking about how that relates to fossil fuels that in our usage of fossil fuels we've kind of taken out more than our allotted portion and, and, and we've we've taken these things and then and then uh, and, and there's been an, an effect of that as well and then now the, the poor of the earth, people who are you know, massively uh, economically disadvantaged compared to ourselves, for them, they do not have access to this, this resource. They, they, they can't use it and, and they need to be now stopped from using this resource at, at some point. Um, and I'd never like, quite connected that with the boundary markers, so, but like as is, is if, is if there, should, there should have been boundary markers on the, on the oil fields and not just on the grain fields. And that's made, and you could argue it has what is what's happened is we've we've actually overspilled the boundary markers on the oil fields, and we didn't and we didn't even realize it. And then and then um, a, a kind of a veritable commentary entry from Nick Bishop listing uh, listing the the full the full range of biblical texts and uh, and in order uh, about creation and new creation. And so we want to talk about the source of creation being God and the destiny of creation being God. Uh, and lots of other relevant passages, again, that we might, uh, we might come back to. So we've got these, we've got this, this, this sort of rich biblical connections on, on uh, the climate crisis. Um, they, the, what I want to do is then make some connections between what we've just talked about there and, and then the, what are the questions that people have? So as I said earlier, these could be sort of just general theological questions about the, the why and the how and the how come about climate, the climate crisis, or they could be questions that you feel the church needs to answer or that, or that we face as we kind of have discussions with others. So um, I wonder if we could go back into those breakout groups, but this time um, list the questions that, uh, that people have about um, uh, that people have or they're aware of, and then again we'll do the, we'll do the same thing. We'll take note of them in the chat. 
Okay, everyone, welcome back. Um, as we go through, there'll be a place for kind of questions, comments, observations, but it'd be really helpful if people could put uh, kind of key questions in the, in the chat. I'm just making, these are great. I'm just sort of uh, making notes of them as we, as they come up. Hmm. Okay. Well, okay. It turns out we have got some, quite a lot of questions to look at then. Some of, some of these questions are about, about creation, about what it means to live in God's creation, what it means to have dominion. A question uh, raised at, at the beginning by Ewan, uh, if we have dominion over nature, those words taken from Genesis chapter one, what does it mean if, if we say that we, we've, we've got dominion over nature? And, and a couple of people importantly raised the question about, well, what if, uh, as Nick, I can't remember if you did this in our group or, or, uh, or it must have been our group, talking about the, if, if creation is disposable. And, and then uh, Simon, you also say, if God has promised to renew the earth at the end of time, well, then does that mean that, that God will, will sort this, uh, that God will sort this out? Uh, which is a, a little bit like what Ewan has said, if God is all powerful, will he fix it? And all of that comes down to that question again that Ewan asks, well, how does climate change fit into the biblical narrative? So, so there's something about how we understand this in terms of creation and new creation, which is probably where a good place that we should begin. And then um, there's some really important questions about justice. How do we, how do we engage with other uh, other people, other societies, and what, what does this mean about our, our politics? So how do we get involved with this politically? How do we get involved with this internationally? Uh, and then how do we get involved with it more personally, both in terms of the active, you know, what, what do we do? What do we do about banking? What do we do about investments? Uh, but also in, in the mix of this, how do we balance hope and fear? I think that's a, a really helpful question that Stuart's typed in. So, therefore, so I suggest we begin with um, with creation and, and, and new creation, and then and then go on to those sort of practicalities, and let's let's see how we let's see how we go. So, um, what would you say if if somebody says, "Well, hold on, we were given dominion over the world"? It says it says in Genesis chapter one. I'm going to quote from the NIV version. Uh, God blessed them. Chapter one, verse twenty-eight: Be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth, and subdue it rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So if God has given us dominion, what is wrong with us doing with creation what we wish to do or what we find it needful to do? How would you answer that question in, an, in a nutshell? Yes, Nick, do you want to get us started? Well, I think we um, have to take into account uh, Genesis uh, 3, don't we? The fall. We're no longer living in this Garden of Eden. <laughs> I mean, that goes back to what Christianity is about, isn't it? It's the, uh, it's the, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. Mm. Uh, I don't know what the Hebrew word, how it can be interpreted, whether it can be interpreted subdue or dom uh, dominion or it can, it, can it be steward uh, uh, is there an element of respect in that word i don't think it quite stretches as far as steward steward's steward's a word that we like to uh, to use sometimes in, in in terms of care for the environment we can maybe talk about it a bit more and john swells was in the call and and, and tuesday and, and his hebrew is about 100 times better than mine but um but I don't think that we could take the word for rule or have dominion and entirely make it steward, uh, look after. If you want look after, you have got look after in, in the next chapter. Uh, is it uh, God put the man, uh, chapter two, verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Now that is a much more... Um, care you know it's it, it, yeah a, a careful notion of the human place in the world whereas um the implication in in genesis one is is of rule or or dominion what else would people say then about so we could we could we could certainly point out that you know that's that that was at the start of the story before things as it were went went wrong 
and we have to bear in mind all the ways that human human rule and dominion gets twisted out of shape. What else would you say about our dominion? Yeah, Mark. I think you actually just touched on it there and that the Bible has plenty else to say about right action of those who are ruling and those who are in power, particularly when massive inequality exists as well. And you can't take, well, this says it's ours to do with as we please and not then also take, but here's all this other stuff about actually how you should approach that position and what you should be doing and the thing you should think about and worry about. And you, you can't have one without the other. Yeah, that's great. So our image of, so, it, so we won't necessarily get it just by diluting the word rule. We might get it rather than trying to dilute the word rule, we might actually try and um, like intensify its meaning. And say, okay, let's talk about rule. What is good rule? What is good dominion? What does it mean to be responsible for something? Um, we have the example of the kings in, in the Old Testament. They are held to account as to whether their rule is a just rule, whether it's life-giving, whether it leads to um, yeah, whether it leads to justice and the flourishing of society and creation. And of course, the other example of rule we have is God's rule, which is a which is which is absolutely life giving and creative. And so if those are our examples of rule, both divine rule, which is um, ceaselessly creative and life giving and human rule, which is held to account for the times when it isn't, then we're, we've actually been given a definition of a worked definition of rule, which is about care and flourishing and not about use because oh i'm going to keep using this even if it turns out that using it is is damaging to creation to justice to the lives of others i was just going to add as well i think mark you touched on this on the tuesday session as well but um about the the, the meaning of the word subdue i believe i'm a big fan of um Tim Mackey, an American theologian, for anyone who doesn't know him, he does podcasts and um, he talks about how the Genesis story is all about bringing order out of disorder. So the world starts off disordered and then what do God does in creation is orders it. So I think it, what he's saying is the word subdue is about ordering the earth. And there was one particular episode where I was talking about he was linking up to agriculture so we order the earth through agriculture but that doesn't mean that we exclude you know um animals as well um so yeah I just found that helpful and yeah I just want to stick a reference to Tim Mackey in there if I can <laughs> so that was from the um I think it was the identity of God series as well an episode called humans and animals so it talks about exactly that so. So that's Tim Mackey, The Identity of God, a podcast available. That's Bible, the, the Bible Project po podcast, that is. Bible Project pod podcast. She, she's not on commission. <laughs> um, yes. I mean, order and chaos is a funny thing. I mean, um, there is there is a notion of, uh, and we talked about it a bit on Tuesday, of, of, of ordering that goes on in the work of creation. Uh, it's a little complicated if we press into it too much in the sense that the God, God is the source of the chaos. Um, it, so the more, the more you press primal chaos, the more you press, the more it, it can only really have one source. If it's primal, uh, by definition, um, which may be indeed, you know, something we can work with. But but um, the, certainly the, the, the work of God is, is in is in Genesis described as an, an ordering work and or one of the kind of, yeah, creating spaces. I mean, we were talking about, you know, farming techniques in our little breakout group. Um, when we're involved in even like gardening or, or any kind of task, which is, which is even a bit agricultural, you can't control everything that happens. It's organic, right? So it's, it is about order, but it's not about, it's not a, you can't tell everything what to do. I mean, Jesus makes the point, doesn't he, in the parable, you know, you, you plant a seed, you don't know, you don't know when it's coming. You, can, you can't check on it. I mean, you could try and dig it up and check on it, but it, things won't end well. So actually, um, when, we're, when we're involved with the natural order, we're aware of chaotic and organic elements and, we're, um, and we can't fully impose order on that. And that, in a sense, 
the, the early chapters of Genesis kind of wrestle with that and other parts of scripture as well. Occasionally it is couched in um, very dramatic mythical language as the slaying of a beast, uh, of, of a Leviathan or um, Rahab the beast, um, the, the, slay, the slaying of a beast. So the, the scriptures wrestle with and play with this imagery of order and chaos. But what we know is that, yeah, there are, there are boundaries and, and God's, God's work is to, is to create fruitful boundaries where, where there can be um, organic life and independent life, but there's a sense of, of order and proportion. And I guess that means, I mean, one of the things I was going to throw in, because we talked about Job earlier. Job was one of our Bible passages. The book of Job is really great because um, it's not as if Genesis 1 is actually designed to give us everything we need to know about creation. And I think we, we sometimes think about it and say, well, if I'm, going to, if I'm going to be biblical, what I need to do is sort of, you know, begin at the, I mean, you, you wouldn't do that to someone who's a new Christian, would you? You say, look, if you want to, if you want to uh, understand Christianity, just read the Bible all the way through from the start. It will all, it will all make sense. We probably know any of us that that's it, it's possible. I mean, that could be amazing, but it could also backfire because actually, um, it's not actually, although it's it's not actually fully chronologically indexed, is it? It's not really designed quite like that as as as, as a library of resources. So something like Job, which occurs you know around about the middle of the Bible, actually talks about creation, and it talks about creation as something in which we find ourselves. And God questions Job and said, do you, know, do you even have a clue what, how this stuff works? Do you have access to the sources of power that I have access to? Do you, do you even, are you, were you there when this thing happened? And, and Job has to say, well, you, you're right. You're, you're right. I, I, I don't understand this. So, so we are, the language about dominion in creation and the, and the first, story, first stories at the start of Genesis aren't the only thing we have to go on. We have a rich picture in the Old Testament that draws in multiple strands. And one of the strands in Job is just plain awe and wonder. Um, and uh, if, if we're gonna name drop scholars, I will also name drop uh, Richard Borkham, who does a, has a wonderful book, Bible and Ecology. And he, like others, talk about humans as, as co-creatures. Uh, and how important it is that, that, that what the Bible tells us is not just that we are that we, and even stewards, you see, that, that's what I mentioned the language earlier. Even the language of stewards rather assumes that we're in control. But actually, as you were saying, Nick, even, even, the, even the rule, you know, is given in chapter one, if you like, and in uh, chapter two expressed as care. But in chapter three, it's kind of lost, messed up, subverted, uh, gone awry. And that's a bit more what that's not, then we're getting closer to what the Hebrew Bible says. So if we read in the Hebrew Bible and the, the Old Testament, we say, well, the truth is we're in charge and God put us in charge. Actually, that, that that's too simplistic. The truth is there's both order and chaos. The truth is that we're both entrusted with stewardship, but we've kind of forfeited any moral authority. The truth is we are both overseeing creation, able to, to survey it but also part of creation, co-creatures, alongside the rest of the community of creation. And Richard Borkham talks about the community of creation, and we've forgotten to live as members of the community of creation. And we think that there's us. In fact, when we talk about creation, we don't even think we're talking about ourselves. So, um, so actually, we want to, it's, it's not that this word dominion, we can't expunge it from the biblical record, but we can put it in, in conversation with other, other words, words about awe and wonder, words about um, what kind of, of rule and stewardship and things that go way beyond stewardship to say, look, we're just, we're just a small part of this immensely complex thing that we don't really fully understand. And in the light of that, how should we now live? Anything else about creation before we move on to new creation? Okay, well, you asked for it then. So what, so what do you say to somebody who says, well, hold on, the world, why should we care for the environment? Because actually, it's going to be, it's going to be destroyed anyway. It says in the scriptures, you know, that the, the, the heavens will roll, be rolled up like a scroll, there'll be a new heavens and a new earth. So why, why do we need to look after the present 
earth and heavens if God, God has the matter in hand? And there are other important things to, to do in the meantime. How would people address that, that one? You may feel I'm just ducking this by throwing it back. <laughs> but I thought, <laughs> I'm glad you said that on mute, Nick Bishop. Um, uh, but I'm interested, what would you say? I think that issue of justice is, is, is one thing. I mean, people are being affected now. And, uh, and, and, and we are enjoined to be part of God's kingdom right now and to enjoy it. And we are, our actions or our inaction are preventing people from enjoying God's good creation. Uh, I would say that the, we do have the first fruits of the new creation. Uh, and Jesus' uh, transformed, resurrected body is a sign of how that would happen. It has a link with the pre-resurrection body, with the wounds. Uh, but it's transformed. It's different. It can go through walls as well as eat fish. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think transformation, what the plan of the Bible is to transform creation. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, a, a no... Um, uh, reason or uh, we shouldn't ignore cre creation or abuse it we should care for it because it's going to be transformed that would be how I try and argue it <laughs> um, and, and, and Christianity is not just a spiritual religion it's uh, the, sp the word spirit is often misinterpreted it, it's really about being in a, a, a sort of going along with God to be a spirit-filled person, which is both physical and uh, spiritual and um, mental. It's not uh, um, a split personality, matter and spirit. It's all together. It's holistic. So, yeah, that's mm. how I would argue it. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. I suppose the fact that God has promised that it will all be put right in the end doesn't necessarily absolve us from the responsibility of being part of that solution and it's working through. Um, I can't quite remember now who wrote the prayer, but there is the prayer about there are no hands here apart from you know, Jesus' hands being our hands and Jesus' feet being our feet and things like that. Yeah. So, yeah, I suppose that um, flash reassurance that it will all be put right eventually quickly dissipates and you end up actually feeling more responsible when you realise that um, God might be relying on us to, um, to sort, sort that and be part of the solution. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, um, do you know, when I was, I mean, oh, um, when I was training for ordained ministry in... Um, whatever it was now, 18 years ago, um, uh, I had come across some sermons by, uh, by Tom Wright and uh, Nick, I know we were talking about this in the, in the breakout group. And, and I actually did a, an essay on, well, um, you know, if there's gonna be a new creation, um, you know, does that mean we should care for the environment? And, um, the, th the funny thing is actually, but um, you know, whisper it because I did actually, I did actually get to chat to Tom Wright when we bought Tom Wright to St George's. I got to wangle being his chauffeur, so I could just ask him lots of questions in the car. And um, thing is, I did this essay, and I, I kind of I wrestled with. It. I do I I like I, I like the way you put it, Neil. That's very good. But I did actually run run into a couple of. Uh, logical hurdles actually uh, and I said well you know be because it's going to be transformed we should look after it I, I, I have to be frank and say I, I still I still kind of I wasn't sure I actually convinced myself with my own work I thought well okay uh, yeah because it, partly from for me the logic of because it's going to be transformed we need to look after it I, I still kind of it's a bit like it, it's slightly around the risk of being a bit like you know be because the um, because we're going to get the decorators in we need to look after the old cupboards and I was thinking, well, yeah, but also no. Um, it's it's a very um, it's a very particular way to do theology to say, well, actually, let's talk about what heaven is like, and then that's the way we do things, right? That's what motivates us. We motivate it by by pictures of what what heaven is like, what the future is like. 
Whereas actually, the more I've thought about it, I mean, we, we, the more I've thought, actually, we, we probably almost need to um, do a bit. I was struck by what you said, Stuart. We probably almost need to just sort of be very focused on the now in some respects. And I'm, I might be wrong in that, but I'm, I'm just interested that the now is where um, is where everybody lives. It's where our, 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 our neighbours and colleagues live in, the, in, in this world now. So, so it gives us traction in the in the immediate political challenges and discussions in our workplaces and and you know in politics and so on. But the now is where the injustice is as well. That this is a this is a thing now. Somebody said to me the other month uh, when we were trying to do something on this, they said, "What we've got to do is the problem is Christians have got all the wrong theology of the environment. So we need to get the theology sorted, and then we can we can move forward." And I said, "You're not going to do it." <laughs> We're not going to agree. <laughs> We're going to spend so much time talking about trying to get the theology right. Actually, um, this is about love. And if we don't, if we don't have love, we might as well not bother. Um, and, and that's a now thing. You know, now floods are happening. Now harvests are unpredictable. Now extreme weather events are taking place, and forest fires and and, and, and now, now we're, we're seeing those things and we can see it within sort of a five, 10 year window, what's, what's possible. And so, I'm, so I'm, I just have a, I have a little reservation now about trying to say, well, look, look, the truth is I can tell you about the future. And because I can tell you about the future, this is what we should do in the present. I'm kind of, I'm kind of wondering whether sometimes what we need, what the Bible gives us is not so much, not so much a kind of a map of the destination but an orientation. So the Bible is less like a yeah, less like a less like a map of the destination, and more like a compass for orientation. So it gives us an orientation towards hope. It gives us an orientation towards love. It gives us an orientation. Um, it, it also warns us, as we've I've indicated, that there'll be chaos. There'll be there'll be mess. There'll be there'll be utter human failure. There'll be tragic human consequences. And we've got to steer our way through this with this Bible compass. Uh, and that might be more powerful to us than to say, actually, I've got a map of the destination. Um, because every time Christians have said they did have a map of the destination, it didn't tend to end that well. So I don't want to overplay it. I don't, but I'm just I'm throwing that out as a, as a, pro a provocation to you, really, and, and, and a thought about how, how, the, how the Bible, yeah, how we might use the Bible more as a, more as a compass than a, than a map of the destination. Uh, but other thoughts? We, we could talk a little bit more about this. And Nick, yes, yeah, Nick, what are you thinking? Well, I was just going back to that uh, St. Paul's thing about uh, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. Mm. So it, we are part of that new creation now. And so living in the now as his, to be salt and light and to shine our, our good works and is to, to do these things, to look at the world holistically and care for matter as well as people and show love now. That's all I would say. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, they, so it brings the two things, but so, so it brings the two themes together, this idea of the future, but it's not, it's, you're, it's not, um, you're not approaching it as a, as a kind of distant future uh, or an idealized future, it's 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 uh, it's of interest because it's because it's active in the present. Just mm. a little thought, which is really just rephrasing what you said, I suppose. But I suppose the sort of humanist view of the world would be: we need to make the world a better place because that that's all there is. Whereas you could say the Christian worldview would be: we need to make the world a better place because that's what heaven is like. That's what eternity is going to be like. Um, and so, we, you know, we know what good, we know what is good and we're aiming for that, but we're never going to get there. But, you know, we're building some of that now. I suppose it's like the Christian aid, um, what's the Christian aid tagline is we believe in life before death, isn't it? Which is, is a great one. Um, yes. These are the things that remain faith, hope and love. So let's build the world like that now. Yes, I guess I'm just, I'm, uh, no, that makes sense. And I think um, I was struck in our discussion on Tuesday in, in terms of, 
I don't think we always, I think, isn't one of the things that the environmental crisis teaches us that we don't always know what we're building? So we say, we're building this because we believe that. And in the future, this thing we're building now will turn into this. But isn't what we realized that we didn't realize what we were building? And so the, as you rightly say, like you might have an atheistic version, we say, this is the thing that we're building and this is how we're building it. Well, in the last 100 years, those great atheistic regimes, which thought they knew how they were building things and what they were building, uh, you know, the Soviet Union, um, uh, Maoist China, you know, they caused immense, immense human suffering because in, a, in an atheistic vision, they thought they knew what they were, they thought they knew what they were building. And, and, and in that sense, lost sight of the thing that was right in front of their faces. Uh, but there's, a, and, and we might look at Christian history as well, might we? And look at what Christians have built because they thought they knew what they were building. So um, I, I'm just saying that the, uh, the, the um, well, what does it mean to, to inhabit the, the biblical narrative with real humility? How do we, how do, we do that? And, and how do we inhabit our place in the world with, with humility? Anything else about the future then? I mean, it's, it's an interesting one and we've, we've pondered around it a bit. What mark did you get for that essay? <laughs> oh, it was great. It was over 70, Nick. <laughs> Yeah, we talked, we talked, uh, my last thing on that, and then we should move on to like politics and the personal, shouldn't we? But my last thing on that was, I think we, we talked about on Tuesday about, about doing things just because they, just because they're good, just because they're good, they're good now. And what the Bible does teach us is that, uh, I mean, as Nick, you were talking about, uh, reality is holistic, that the, that the material and the spiritual are bound together. And we don't need to play off the material against the spiritual or, or vice versa. And so uh, our calling as Christians is to be engaged in things which are good. I don't know if we always know what we're, what we're building, um, but I know that we're called to do good. I, and I don't entirely know how that relates to what's coming in the future. Uh, and I don't really think the Bible really uh, implies that we do, that we are to do that. I think you have to do Quite a lot of jumps to, to try and work that out. What, what I think, as, as you were saying, Nick, we, we, we're to be a new creation in, in being called to, to, to offer the members of our body to, 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 to do the good. Uh, and if you, if you see something that is good, to, to get on and, and to do it. And, and that's the biblical calling. And then what exactly God's going to do in the future, um, I think sort of scientifically and theologically, I'm not... I'm not convinced that we really know. Uh, as you say, like when, what we know about the risen body of Jesus is it defied, it defied expectation. And yet it was wonderfully material and uh, translucently spiritual. It was radiantly spiritual and wonderfully material. And, uh, and that gives us hope for, for doing what's good in the present now because it's, because it's worth doing, because, because God calls us to. Well, we might, we might come back to some of those themes. Should we move on to, um, so faith and politics. Um, how, do we, how do we tackle the moral question here? How do we respond to the common assertion that faith and politics don't mix? Does, does, the, does, does action on the climate imply a particular kind of politics? Does it commit us to one kind of, does it put us somewhere on the, on the political scale? Should, and should Christians be nervous of, of nailing their colours too much to, a, to one political solution? Or are we, are we called just to roll our sleeves up and, and get political? What do people think? I think it can, in, but when it does, it's... Sorry, your question is, does taking a certain stance on the environment put us somewhere on a political spectrum? I don't think that there is a political spectrum. It's more dimensions than just the one blue to red or however you want to think about it. But I think particularly in, for example, in America, it's become very politicized and it puts you very much at one end rather than the other. I think that's starting to disintegrate a bit. But yeah, politics is never just one dimensional. So I think it's 
humans that make it like that and if we're challenged on that we should point out that mm -hmm. you can't just it, it isn't just a, a one-dimensional discussion mm -hmm. um, and actually there's lots of there's lots of capitalist type arguments for protecting the environment as well <laughs> they just haven't really been understood or uh, recognized or re until relatively recently yeah, Stuart. Well, I would say that um, Jesus didn't um, didn't shy away from uh, political politically sensitive areas and actions, and so neither should we. Simple as that. But what was the nature of his involvement in 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 politics? Can we? Can we? He spoke truth to power. Um, he, he, he called out practices that were immoral, I guess. Um, and and he, he, he put his life on the line, in a sense, for standing up for, 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 thing, for justice. Um, I think the answer to about faith and religion, uh, sorry, faith and, and politics not mixing, I, I would say, yes, they do mix. They, they, should, they should be held together for, for similar reasons to what Nick was saying about being holistic. Mm. Mm, thank you. What else do people think about faith and politics then? Is, is it helpful to try and distinguish between politics and party politics and just I guess make it more about specific issues I, I don't think anyone even even possibly the leader of a political party would say in their in all honesty do they degree agree with absolutely everything in their manifesto mm -hmm. it's always a compromise by the people that have put that together and are members of that party I would guess or where they think the votes sit. They might not admit it, but I think that's the reality. It seems a bit to me that things aren't going to change in terms of the climate crisis without politics being involved, like for people who aren't associated with a religion. So in a way, religion has to get on board to, to be... A voice that's got got a reason behind it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just interesting whether um, I'm pondering what you were saying, Stuart, about whether Jesus died. The 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 death of Jesus as polit as a political act, and that he died, he died to. I'm just trying to think how how far along that line I w I would want to go. But but I know that there, you know different Christians would express that differently, and it's 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 linked with this point. I think maybe you was point about party politics versus, you know, I, I think um, politics. One of the things about politics is it's it's negotiation about shared resources. You know, how do we decide what it means to be us? How do we decide where the resources go? All sorts of different resources, and um, in a way, I wonder if. You know, we want to, it doesn't sound there's much appetite in the room to say, well, the kingdom of God is over here and politics is somewhere else and the two don't, don't touch. But I guess the interesting question is, well, do they entirely overlap? And, and sometimes I, wouldn't, I worry um, for our, um, you know, because uh, all, we, we pick up so much of our theology and our songs and everything from America, don't we? It all, it all drifts over the Atlantic through the, the, the Christian wind um, the Christian transatlantic jet stream carries American songs and American theology and, uh, over, over to, the, to the UK and, um, and, and we live in, its, in, it, in this slipstream. And, and both, both beloved wings of, of the American culture wars both involve religion and politics. It, they both involve Christianity and politics very directly. And uh, makes me wonder sometimes, you know, the kingdom of God both is 
and isn't a political reality. You know, it touches on the things of politics, it touches on resources, it challenges leaders, it exposes hypocrisy, but it is it cannot be identified with a party political program. And so, uh, as you were saying, Janet, we can, you know, there's all this politics is going on right now. So we're either going to ignore it or we get involved with it. But we can actually get involved with it without entirely equating the kingdom of God to one particular political agenda, which, which is probably a good thing. I think one of, one of the other things I'm hopeful and excited about is that um, there needs to be a way to be a, a green conservative. And there needs to be a way to be a green liberal Democrat because, uh, and a green member of Labour and, 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 and Scottish National and so on, because these parties, they already exist and they reflect social distinctions anyway, which aren't going to disappear overnight. What we kind of need is we need for everybody to be green. In fact, we, we, we need, we kind of almost need green not to be a thing anymore. We need it just to be, to be the reality so that we don't talk about it as being green. We just, we just get on and do it. And for that, we need to go beyond the, the, the kind of allegiances of party politics. And that's one of the reasons why I, I'm, ner I'm nervous of entirely nailing the, well, I certainly don't want to nail the, the um, environmental agenda to an anti-capitalist agenda. Because uh, A, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure what people mean to replace it. Um, uh, and... Um, uh, or which other period of history they would like us to return to. And B, I, I kind of feel that, uh, I feel that it's, uh, well, B, I, I feel that it's unrealistic that we're going to make the change, let's deal with the cold climate crisis and let's invent a new world economic system at the same time. I know they're related, but I'm just trying to be realistic here. I, and C, I'm worried about trying to, uh, about identifying the kingdom of God too tightly with one particular political political system. Because I kind of feel that, that there are different political systems and, and none of them is, is identified entirely with the kingdom of God. But I've, I've thrown out some more provocations there as well. Stuart, what are you gonna? Well, I was just gonna say, yeah, I totally agree with that. And uh, if, if any of you have listened to Mark Carney and the, and, and, and the advice that he gives to business, that's, um, that's the, he, he has a very green message, um, but it's not the message of, for, for, you know, the sort of radical left wingers or something like that. But, but we need the whole spectrum. I mean, American, I think, as uh, Ewan was suggesting, American industrialists and people like that are, are, are taking, some of them are taking these green issues very seriously. So it's not, I don't think it's got anything to do with um, left politics or, or, or right politics, um, but it has got to do, as, as, as you pointed out, with the, the use of resources. And um, that's, that seems to be the, 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 you know, fundamental to understanding what the green issues are about. Mm. Yeah, any other thoughts on the politics of it? You and what's that what's that link? Sorry, that's a link to a, a Mark Carney uh, ah, BBC right. Wreath lecture on climate change. It's part of a series, but I found it very very interesting. And I think that might be what Stuart's referring to, but he's he said lots of other things in other forums as well. Mm. Fortunately in this country it seems a much less party political issue, doesn't it, than it does in the States, and that must be welcomed. Um, but I think I think we have to engage with politics because, for better or worse, that's the way that we evoke change, isn't it, in the UK and um, in most of the Western world. So um, I think if you want to uh, change things, then you have to tell those who are representing us in government um, what we want uh, and how to go about it. So. Um, I don't think in that sense politics is dirty, it's just um, our mechanism for saying what we want and how to get there and representing the people fairly, so I think we do have a duty to engage, definitely. I think there's, maybe we've, maybe we've said it already, but the, everything we've said, I guess, uh, as individuals, we will be different sort of political leanings in this group and in the whole of the church, and we can talk to our 
respective parties or MPs about climate change within that context. But if we wanted to have a collective voice to collectively say, we want this to happen, mm -hmm. we can still do that if we pick an issue rather than a, a party to say mm -hmm. it through. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking particularly previous session we ran was on campaigning and we're trying to figure out how as a as a church or as a group that we engage politically um, particularly around COP26 the UN conference in November and that's an issue it's not a particular party it happens that in the UK the Conservatives are in power at the moment so perhaps they'll they're the focus mm. of of our discussions at the moment but it could have been another party just as well mm. and we'd still be saying more or less the same thing I think perhaps mm. putting a slightly different spin on it mm. more to not because our opinion necessarily is different, but because the listener, the audience is different. I was just gonna ask how unified is the church on the issue? I mean, I suppose if I was guessing, I would say some people are very concerned and active and there's perhaps an, a majority who are perhaps very neutral and there's not many people in opposition or thinking in op an opposite view, is that true? Or are there actually elements within the church that are very opposed to us all worrying about the climate emergency and is it worse than I fear? Well for, for my from from what I see um, the great thing about the church in England is you don't have to oppose anything you just have to drag your feet so I don't think our challenge in the church in England I mean, like I say there are American narratives that we wrestle with and drift across the waves but in the main I don't think that's our big our big issue they're only so they're only so influential here because we produce so little of substance ourselves it's the lack of cultural creation where we are is that is the is the lack of of real initiative here uh, and initiative is unevenly spread at the minute uh, and it always will be i guess but uh, so my general sense is the church is just off the pace that's all that's our biggest challenge and which body within the church is best placed to lobby government or you know, I don't really have a good understanding of how church and government interact on issues like this. But as besides from us as individuals and perhaps collectively as a church, St George's Church or whichever church, is there, you know, a more corporate body that represents the church view that goes a bit more central to government? Well, I think that's a, it's a great question. I'll give a, a my personal answer, which isn't you know, it makes no pretense to be like the, the best one out there, but it's just the only, it's the best one that I've got is that when I've bashed my head against this, I feel that the church's job, well, I'll make two points actually. The, I, I like, to speak up on our earlier discussion, I like the fact that we're discussing this as an issue of humanity. This is something that affects us according to our humanity. I, I'm personally taken with the vision of the church as an institution alongside other institutions. So the church's job is not to, to be the be all and end all of everything, but the church's job is, is to remind to remind people of the things that get forgotten if we think that all, all, all life is politics. And so I like this idea that we can, I think that's very, very shrewd actually, the church, the church can't and shouldn't ally itself entirely with one political agenda. The church is there to remind us of the things which are bigger than politics. Uh, and that's the thing that only the church can do is to point people, to point people to, to the creator, to point people to the values of, of I mean, it, it, you were saying you know, faith, hope, and love. The church's job is to belong to the kingdom of God, is to belong to faith, hope, and love. And therefore it can't belong to any political agenda. And I would link that to, to your, your point, Sam, it's a really interesting one. The, the, the thing that I've personally landed in, on, on in it is, is that I think what we need to do is change the way, is change the conversation. So I think if the, the church can lobby government, but government will listen to people. It won't listen to the church. It certainly won't listen to it because it's the church. And it won't really listen to it because the church represents a lot of people, because it doesn't. But what does strike me about the church is that we all have neighbors. Um, some of us are working in businesses or our children go to schools. And the thing that I'm most excited about is Christians changing the, the nature and the temperature of the conversation about the climate where they are. 
because when we change the nature and the temperature of the climate uh, of the conversation about the climate we change what the politicians and the businesses pay attention to our example in this i think without and uh, i can do this without a stir, uh, opening a can of worms because we've only got five minutes to go uh, is is the um is the is sexuality every single kind of business is falling into line with the mainstream media view on on sexuality right now everyone's falling over i mean it's one of the great issues of the gay movement is they they can't you know you can't move for people getting a stall at, at gay pride because it's like the thing to do why is it the thing to do because it became the conversation and suddenly politicians and businesses have no choice but to, to jump in line so I think that the number one thing I feel that we should be doing, we should be lobbying and people are busy lobbying, but I don't think the church is telling the government anything it doesn't already know. But what I think the, the government is looking to the church and other people to say, change the conversation, get people talking about this, talk about it in your homes and communities, talk about it in the schools. We've been doing this thing, the Climate Emergency Toolkit, because I'd like every institution to declare an emergency, whether it's big or small, whether it's a cafe, a school, a legal practice, a hospital, a college. I think every institution, I'm so glad St George's have declared a climate emergency, uh, St Hill College have as well. And then I think the next thing is to get every Christian to get the institution that they're part of, connected with, paid by, supply for, to declare a climate emergency as well. Uh, and, and then everybody's talking about it. And then when you change the temperature and the nature of the conversation, I, th I think that's, th that's one of the missing pieces. Otherwise, it all falls down to individual activism, which is, which is always better if you've got more resources, if you can afford a greenhouse, if you can, you know, whatever, or the national and international, which is vital, but it's movemental. And, it's, and the church can play a part in that, but it's only a small cog in the work. So we should certainly, you know, make a fuss of COP26, go and protest, write letters, whatever. But, but some of it is, is a bit beyond our pay grade. It's, it's, it's big stuff. We can only play a small but vital part. But what we really can do is this sort of opinion forming, conversation starting, pace setting. Um, and I, I really, I really hope, I hope we can do that. And I hope the green agenda for what it's worth isn't about just saying, well, look, we know we've got to, you know, we've got to be careful about disposable cups at the back of church and that kind of thing. I just think that the thing that I'm most, that we, we, I think, should be most passionate about is, is all the places God has put us in our streets and communities and, and where we have an influence. And that's what it means, I think, in this time to be salt and light. I'm preaching there. Forgive me for preaching again. Well, we need to we need to wrap that up, uh, but hopefully we've hopefully we have struck a, a balance of of fearful awareness of what's happening, but also hope and positivity about what the church can do. Uh, and I wonder, just as we as we draw to a close, uh, I wonder, Stuart, would you be able to pray for us as we as we move on and out from here? Father God, we thank you for your creation and the the wonder and the awe that it inspires as we go for our daily walk in the, in the beauty of our surrounding um, woods or parks. Lord, we, we, we love your creation. And yet we uh, do get fearful sometimes when we see how, how terribly it is being spoiled and, and we get concerned when we see the effect that climate change has on um, our, our brothers and sisters across the world. And Father, we, we just pray that um, out of these conversations that we've been having, uh, you will help us to hold in balance that, uh, that fear for what could be and the hope that you put in our hearts. And help us not to be inactive and help us not to feel guilty about the things that we can't do. Um, but just give us wisdom, Lord, so that we might go forward from here and, uh, and be your... Your, your people um, to be, as it were, uh, your arms and legs um, so that we might be able to uh, serve you and do the things that uh, you would have us do uh, to bring attention to the issues of climate change. And Lord, we pray that you will fill us, each one of us, with your spirit of wisdom so that we might do that winsomely and lovingly um, with our neighbours and friends and work colleagues and those around us.
So we thank you for this time. Thank you for Mark and all that he has brought to us this afternoon. And we thank you for your great love for us in Jesus. Amen. Amen.